Dungeon Keeper 2, sequel to Dungeon Keeper 1, is a tower-based strategy game created in 1999 by Bullfrog Productions, who after their last release in 2001, Theme Park Inc., would cease to exist and most of their staff would join EA having been bought by them in 1995. I'll open with the story, there isn't much. You're the new unnamed keeper depicted as a floating hand who's being guided by the mentor to open the way to the surface world for Old Horny. To do this, you'll have to conquer Harmonia, Land of Heroes and Do-Gooders. On the way, you'll have to kill human generals and other minor keepers, but your main foes are a keeper called Nemesis, alongside his two sons and the king with his three sons, Felix, Balder and Tristan. You'll do this by using your imps to clear out dirt and collect gold. This will provide you with the space and money to build different rooms to expand your dungeon. Each room type will attract specific creatures to your dungeon. I'll go into more detail in a minute. All this while protecting your dungeon heart, which if you allow to fall, will be the end of your days as a keeper. So how does it look? There isn't much to say, so I'll be brief. It looks good. Yes, it's very of its time and everything looks like a 2D picture pasted onto a 3D model. If you play older games, it's something you'll be used to. The environment and art style suit the mood of the game. It's dark, it's drab, nothing looks out of place and it all fits within the world of Dungeon Keeper. I don't think the graphics take away from the gameplay at all. Again, short and sweet. There's a few different soundtracks throughout the game. The first one being the menu ambience. <laughs> Followed by the in-game ambience. And finally, the battle music. Each creature has its own unique sounds and voice lines, which add a nice bit of flavour to the game. All in all, the soundtracks and monster sounds suit the theme of the game very well. But the star of the show has to be the mentor. You have chosen the most difficult path, Keeper. There is no portal available. Voiced by Richard Ridings, definitely one of my all-time favourites. You'll also recognise his voice from many other games and TV shows. I'll put a few examples on screen. The main one being... I'm an expert at talking. We need... Have a big world. Now an overview of the gameplay. The goal to most missions is the same. Go get the portal gem. You start this by clearing out dirt and collecting gold to make space for your dungeon to grow. For every tile you take, an imp will have to claim it. They do this automatically. You can now use the gold you found to build different types of rooms to suit your needs and attract creatures to your dungeon, and in turn build up an army. Though your creatures must be kept happy and will not fight for free, so you have to keep them well fed and paid in full or they'll leave. Now is a good time to talk about the portal where creatures enter your dungeon. This has a limited capacity to how many creatures it can attract, which is 15 for the first portal and 5 for every one after that, assuming you have sufficient layer space to hold the creatures. Exceptions being creatures you created yourself, such as the skeleton. This can be quite limiting, so once you start getting higher in buildings, you'll want to kill off your lower-end creatures to make space for the new one. You'll have to train your creatures so they can level up and put up a decent fight. The combat isn't the strongest aspect of this game, a lot of it will come down to just overwhelming your opponent. As long as your creatures are a similar level, you should win. A lot of difficulty comes in by the restrictions of the map slash mission, some of these being space limitations, so you really have to think about how you want to place your dungeon. Or you can even get into situations where you don't even have a creature portal. If I had to summarise the gameplay loop in short, it'd be this. Clear out space for your dungeon, attract and train up creatures, pick where you want to attack, then send everything in. I'm going to break the campaign down into sections, whilst describing what each room does as they get introduced, because in simple terms, what each room does and what creature they attract is a big part of the game. The missions start with a small description of the scenario to set the scene and give you a hint to any limitations. The first mission, Warcry, is straightforward, it's pretty much a tutorial. Just go find the enemy hero and kill him. Here you'll be introduced to the first two rooms. These are the lair, used by your creatures to relax and recover from battle, and the hatchery, which provides food. The first two rooms will attract the goblin, a low in creature that isn't very strong alone, but in groups is enough to do the first few missions. Enchantments, same as before, just with the addition of two dwarfs alongside the enemy hero, but more importantly, you're introduced to two more rooms. Training room. It's used to train your creatures up to a maximum of level four at the cost of gold. It will need to be expanded if you want to train more creatures at the same time. This room will attract the Salamander, a hot-blooded lizard with a melee attack and fireball spell. This creature is not only immune to lava but moves quicker while in it, making it an ideal scout for some levels. Library. Where the Warlock resides, a spellcaster with okay combat ability given an adequate front line. His main standout spell is Heal. The job of the Warlock is to study scrolls and research spells. These cost mana to cast which is generated automatically over time to a maximum of 200,000. 
Each spell can be researched twice given enough time, making it into a better version of what it was before. The library itself can also be used to store hidden artifacts which you find whilst exploring the map. These can be different variations of one-use buffs, a few examples being a free level for all your creatures or reinforcing all the dungeon walls. I'm going to mention some of the spells I use most to give you an idea on what's on offer. First off, Summon Imp. It's all in the name, it creates more imps to allow quicker expansion or just to replace any that have fallen in battle. You're going to use this a lot. Sight of Evil. This temporarily allows you to clear a small area of the fog of war to allow you to scout ahead. Possession. This spell changes everything. It allows you to take direct first person control of any minion under your control. Which doesn't sound like much on the surface, but it allows you to trivialise most of the game's combat given enough patience. I'll show you a few examples of what I mean. Here you can see I'm just sort of casually walking around the back of the monster, and with it being a spellcaster it can't really hit me if I carry on doing this. In this little clip you can just see I'm stood at the corner attacking the turret, it doesn't even know I'm there. Now, the one in the background is attacking me, but due to possession I can just sidestep the projectiles, which of course you couldn't do if you didn't have direct control over the monster. So you can see even with only a few examples the sort of power this spell has, which makes it hard to tell if it was intentional or they didn't know when they decided to put it in the game, so I thought I'd check if this spell was in the first game. As I've not played Dungeon Keeper 1, I went to the wiki and yes, possession is a spell that existed in Dungeon Keeper 1. So they must have been aware of the game breaking power of this spell and put it in anyway. Fair enough. With that in mind, I'll leave it up to you to decide to what extent you use possession on your playthrough. Greed. Mine all the gold to lure out the enemy hero. This mission is an introduction to traps and also introduces two more buildings. Workshop. Used to create defensive structures ranging from doors to traps, the doors being wood, barred, steel, magic and hidden. The magic door which fires a fireball spell on a straight line when a creature gets close but isn't quite as strong as a steel door. The very useful hidden door, this disguises itself as a normal piece of terrain, tricking your enemies into seeing nothing and in turn not attacking it. Very useful for sneaking around the map. Traps are also created in the workshop. A few examples are spike trap which damages enemies who walk over it. Sentry trap which provides defense at a range but requires mana to sustain which is only an issue if you have a lot of them. The fear trap will scare low level enemies away but won't affect creatures like the skeleton, which know no fear, being dead and all. This room will attract the troll, a weak fighter but avid smith who enjoys working, especially with a little persuasion. They can also spot hidden traps but this isn't something I've ever used on the campaign so just keep them locked in the workshop instead. Also the vile demon, who serves the same function but has the best health of any creature you can attract at the cost of being hungry all the time, so make sure to keep him close to a hatchery. Treasury. Used to store your surplus gold once your dungeon heart is full as it caps out at 15,000. Snipers. This mission you get a bit more free reign with the map being bigger, a few turrets placed around and a couple of hero portals which will summon out waves of creatures every so often. You'll also get the use of another room. Guard room. A place used to create a defensive area for your units to patrol, so it's generally put on the edge of a dungeon or as a block between you and the enemy. Units left will patrol unless they are hungry, tired or it's payday. This room attracts the Dark Elf, the ranger of the underworld. With both a melee and a ranged attack, they prove quite useful for taking out turrets and traps placed out of melee reach. Fear. Build up a small attacking force and get past the fear traps blocking your way to the enemy hero. For this we will need to use the newly acquired room. Prison. This is my favourite room. It's one of the first things I build when I get the chance as it pays off very quickly. What it does is to allow your imps to drag unconscious enemies back to your dungeon and A. Store them to be tortured or B, left to rot and die while they would drop gold and turn into skeletons. The skeleton, a creature that doesn't require rest, food or even pain. They fear nothing and are a decent fighter overall, the downside being they take a lot of damage, and once they get destroyed they don't come back. Still, with them being pretty much free and easy to create, they make good cannon fodder. Besieged, having to attack the front gate you are given a pre-built dungeon and no portal. This means units are scarce and you need to find a way around that, so what better time than to introduce? Torture Chamber. The loudest room by far, used to convert enemies to your side which is a good way of getting high level units for free, be it monster or human, though humans don't like being around monsters so they will become unhappy slowly and in turn leave your dungeon. I'd recommend using these as cannon fodder. The torture chamber attracts the dark mistress. A good unit overall having strong attack but a weak defence, they make up for this by not scaring easily even if overwhelmed. They will however spend a lot of time torturing your enemies or even each other. Aftermath. Starting with very limited space and money, you have to work your way around closing hero portals to stop the waves of enemies before moving on to the main hero. You will also come across a new room on your way. 
casino. A room that provides your creatures with entertainment and keeps them happy. Its other function is to make money off your creatures if you find yourself strapped for cash. It also attracts the rogue, his main skill being cloaked on enemy terrain and being able to pick the lock on prisons. This doesn't include heroes, only keepers, so all in all, he's not that great for a PvE match. Scavenger. You start out very limited on this mission because you have no portal to attract monsters. You must rely on other means to build an army and take down the enemy keeper, and to make matters worse, there's a small fort in the middle to deal with as well. Luckily, we're introduced to Home of the Vampire. Graveyard. You used to store dead bodies which attract vampires to your realm. Quite an expensive building for what it achieves and has conflict with the prison as they share the same resource, that being bodies. So you end up making a choice between dragging unconscious creatures to the prison or leaving them to rot and using the corpses in the graveyard instead. They can be both used together but I found it better to just use the prison and any creatures I didn't get to in time died and ended up in the graveyard. It was never a priority of mine to build during the campaign due to its price per square and usually was something I built because I had gold to spare or not at all. The vampire itself is a decent fighter who is quite hard wearing with the main benefit of being when they are killed they are teleported back to your base automatically so don't require an imp to drag them back. The only exception to this rule is if they are killed by a monk with a certain spell. They will just die but this is only really an issue on a few campaign missions. Crusade. Starting out with only imps and no portal means you have to be very sneaky and free the black knights in the prison close by. They will keep you going until you can build up more units by alternate means. After freeing the knights, you will claim a combat pit. A better version of the training room, allowing your creatures to go from level 4 to level 8. The downside being they have to fight each other or you can drop enemy units in from the prison. You do have to be careful as without any imps around to carry unconscious units away they can just straight up die after being knocked down. The Black Knight will be drawn to your dungeon once your combat pit has reached 5x5 five five squares. He has the same stats as a human knight, but overall is one of my favourite creatures, being a very good fighter and a cool looking model. 10 out of 10, would recommend. Angelic. It's you versus two of the keepers. You must fight your way to the middle and claim the temple where you'll gain the favour of the Dark Angels and use them to defeat the other keepers. Temple. Probably the most complicated building with a few different uses, also up there being one of the most expensive per tile along with the graveyard. First use is to attract the Dark Angels. The most powerful unit in the game, at level 10 they have 4 different moves and just all around hitting like a truck. Building a functioning temple being 3x3 three three for sacrifices of 5x5 five five to attract Dark Angels. Your creatures can also worship in the temple to increase their happiness, stop them being angry and also generate mana by forcing its units to pray there. On to the main use of the temple, that being sacrifices, which range from giving you mana quickly at the cost of killing a creature or creating other creatures, traps and spells, which in theory sounds cool, but just ends up being a bit overly complicated to figure out what combinations create what. This will just turn into pulling up the wiki and looking at the sacrifice table to save time. I don't think it's worth using the building at all during most of the campaign, unless you have masses of gold and drag each mission out longer than it needs to be. The Horned Reaper, aka Horny, the best overall spell creature in the game, technically. To summon the Horned Reaper you must collect the 4 Talisman Fragments so he can only be used on the level you obtain one, but once you have all 4 he can be used any time as long as you have sufficient mana to summon him and sustain him. To get all 4 Talisman Fragments you must discover them during 4 specific missions, these being Fear, Caverns, Smashing, Conversion. He's indestructible but requires 100,000 mana to summon for a minute, then 2k mana per second to sustain after that, along with needing things to kill to keep him occupied. So make sure you have full mana to get the most use out of him. The only downside being when he's alone, he's a bit stupid and at times can be kited. I'm going to conclude this by talking about a few of the bad parts of the game and overall if I think it's something I'd recommend playing. The bad. I'm going to break it into two categories. Dungeon Keeper 2 problems and the issues I had whilst playing the GOG version of Dungeon Keeper 2. I have a copy of Dungeon Keeper 2 on disc but for this video I played the GOG version. First the game itself, the main issue is the AI being quite stupid on both sides, with your monsters refusing to attack doors and traps near them and just wandering off into danger. The worst culprit is the imp, they just run off into danger and die a lot getting stuck in the loop of trying to take dangerous territory that they can't get to due to cannons or traps or even monsters. The best way I found to deal with this was to build doors and lock them in, stopping imps from even trying. Not only that, they always seem to prioritise reinforcing walls over taking tiles, which can get frustrating when you're trying to take a hero portal and it's spawning waves. None of these are game killers. Now for the GOG version issues. I can be upfront in saying I didn't look for any fixed patches, I'm lazy on that half, and I managed to just deal with it most of the time, but the amount of audio stutters and glitches were pretty insane.
crashes got more frequent the further I got into the game and it would shut itself down without warning. The worst culprit for this was the possession spell. 99% of the time you'd use it, the FPS would drop very low and it starts to stutter, which wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't a frequently used spell. This combined with the audio glitches getting worse during possession would cause the game to become a Dungeon Keeper remix then crash, so I'd recommend using frequent saves or looking for a fix online. Now to sort of end this. I have to be upfront with my bias for the game, it's something I've played a lot when I was younger and it's something I revisit every few years for a playthrough or two. So would I recommend the game for other people to play? Yes, but only if you can get original copy working or look for a fix online. When it runs smoothly for the price this game's a steal. As an ending note, if you like the gameplay of Dungeon Keeper 2, there's a spiritual successor to the game called War for the Overworld. I haven't played it in a while, but I do remember it being quite good, and I may replay it in the coming months. I just want to tag a small bit on the end of the video. This isn't something I've done before. I'm pretty new to all this, and I've made some rookie errors, to put it politely. First off, I decided to move a few files around to clean up all the clips I was using. You know, make it nice and easy to navigate. Big mistake. As I couldn't relocate half the files and had to reshoot a lot of the gameplay footage. Second. This wasn't fully on me, not having a backup is though, so I wrote out the first draft for this script and as I started to finish it off, I reopened WordPad, bam, all blank, nothing I could do. I tried everything, I even tried a system restore maybe to get half of it back, but no, didn't work. So we'll go with plan B, we'll ask my boyfriend, the IT man, if he has any tricks up his sleeve, no, nah, still nothing, so those words are now floating around in the ether somewhere and we don't use WordPad anymore. Most importantly though, thanks for watching and have a lovely night.